talking tonight about happiness, sustainable happiness, and why that makes my heart sing. But before my presentation starts, I'm actually going to invite you to do something. I'm going to ask you to think about one of the happiest moments in your life, or a moment that you really enjoyed, a moment perhaps of deep contentment. And think about how you could convey that story of that moment to someone else. Because I'm going to ask you to turn to someone near you, and if there isn't someone right beside you, you can find your partner. Introduce yourself if you don't know the person beside you. And in one minute or so, tell them your story. So one of the happiest moments in your life, or an enjoyable moment, a moment of deep contentment. If you see me waving my arms like this, because I know it's going to get noisy, that means it's time to stop telling your stories and, and focus back on me. Okay, so go ahead, start sharing your stories, find a partner. Is that our children are spending so much time with gadgets uh, that they're not spending enough time in nature. 
nature, and yet the happiness research is telling us that people who feel connected to nature tend to be happier. One of the things that um, actually can detract from our experience of happiness is if we get caught in social comparison. And this is how I like to explain this to people. I just arbitrarily named this dog Fifi. I don't really know her name. I just got it off the internet. But, you know, if we look at Fifi, she looks like her owners take care of her. She's got a nice little home. It's all painted with windows and, you know, a nice little cushion, isn't it? Until Fido moves in next door. And Fido's got his name. He's outdoors. But he's even got flowers and grass. Fifi can start feeling. My goodness, I really, you know, need to move to a better neighborhood or something. And we do the same thing. We compare ourselves all the time, uh, whether it's the clothes that someone else is wearing, the hairstyle, uh, the car that they're driving, for example, or their house. Now, this person might be feeling quite wonderful until this person. <laughs> more in terms of material things than us, no matter how much we try to acquire. And because I'm taking a look at things, and this actually came from a magazine. It's not um, a, a shot from there, but I actually put this together because I had seen a magazine that actually was selling happiness and giving it a price tag. But I like to add this one. You might not be able to see it in the back. It says, happiness guaranteed for day of purchase only. <laughs> what we're seeing is that kind of buzz that you can get from acquiring things tends to be short-lived. And it's more from our sense of community, from feeling engaged with friends and family, that you get that enduring sense of, of life satisfaction and contentment. Now you might wonder, how does somebody end up doing happiness research? My guidance counselor didn't suggest it <laughs> in high school. And it really comes from following my heart. Um, after Teachers College, I did a master's degree, and I ended up working at the Social Justice Committee in Montreal. And our work was on third world debt and human rights. And that work took me in 1992 to the Earth Summit to Rio de Janeiro, and where we were talking about sustainability and sustainable development. And while I was there, I met Bunker Roy, who was the director of the Barefoot College in India. And something happened to me. Um, I guess the penny dropped for me. I realized I wanted to go back to school, even though I had vowed I never would. And I decided to go back and do my PhD, focusing on education and sustainability. And I went to the Barefoot College. So that's in Rajasthan.